Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your faithfulness, for your incredible love. I thank you, Heavenly Father, where we as women have been learning how to set boundaries so that we don't lose ourselves in relationships, so that we don't get worn down and weary in relationships. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for how you've pricked the heart of your daughters. But Heavenly Father, I pray for the woman that is here that as you've shown me, she's in the fight of her life. She's going through challenging times, but she's here. Whether she will listen on replay, whether she is on Zoom, whether she is in this sanctuary, God, you know exactly who it is. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we get ready to hear your words, that we will focus our attention on you. May we forget about all that came before, all that will come after. May we just be attentive to your voice. Not the voice of Rosalind, because she's flawed, but may we hear your voice, Heavenly Father. May there be clarity and authority in the name of Jesus as your word goes forth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so here's the question, because I always like to start with a question. How many of us feel that we have been taught how to exit out of a relationship, a marriage, like we felt like we learned how to say goodbye? Anybody? No, isn't that the beauty of this study that she includes not only boundaries, but also goodbyes. And so I just want to review before we kind of get into tonight, some juicy sound bites from this study, because let me tell you, we've had some real juicy sound bites. I remember the first week we sat down and I don't remember what the question was, but I remember Women stating, I don't know what healthy boundaries are, and I'm, I'm reading this because I want to make sure I don't get it wrong. In the past, all of my boundaries have been violated. And I'm sure that if you go table to table, there were similar conversations. There was, there's been heavy discussions. But our prayer is that as you have sat before the Lord you have a new perspective on what boundaries are, on what walls are, and tonight on what goodbyes are. Remember in the first week where we said boundaries are not just a good idea, they are, they're God's idea. So whenever you're struggling on like, is this what I'm supposed to do? Remember they're God's idea. We also learned that trust is the oxygen of all human relationships. It's that trust that you have. This week I heard, uh, I think it was in the video, trust is built with time plus believable behaviors. And I just thought that was so profound. Like you don't just give someone a plate of trust. It's over time. It's the behaviors that happens in the relationship. And then Jim Crest, which at this point, don't we all want a Jim Crest in our life? Like, if you were never sold on therapy before this study, I hope you understand that there is this intersection between having therapy and theology together to help you walk through what it is that you need to walk through. <laughs> but he said, stop dancing with destruction. I found that to be profound, just a juicy little sound bite. And then there was that chart. Oh, the chart. That shows how we can so easily give them that level 10 access. And we just, we just all open. But their capacity is only to give us level three responsibility. And then another quote, consequences are important because without them, when a boundary is violated, bad behavior is validated. You need consequences. And I think when you think about the 
parent-child relationship. How many of us in here are parenting adult children? Oh, it's quite a bit of us. I'm not alone. Okay. We got some adult. Okay. I think we need to build an altar over there somewhere for us. But, but no matter if you have a young child or you have an adult child, there has to be boundaries and consequences, just like in this vertical relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, there's boundaries and there are consequences. Proverbs 25, 28 in the ESV, this was one of the scriptures that says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Remember how we had the whole discussion about walls and how we need to look at the walls different. And some of us were so guarded off that the critical things that we need to thrive and heal, we don't even allow in because we don't even have gates. Like we just got a wall. We've talked about how walls can be broken and there's just full access. And then last week, our sister Giannina, let me tell you something. I will not be stripping anything off this evening. I can promise you that. If you weren't here last week, you missed it. You could watch the replay. But uh, the fact that she was in three different pieces of attire to show us what it feels like, what it looks like, that visual image of stripping off that old man and not picking it back up. There was a quote that she said, you can't live in faith and operate in dysfunction. Where's your allegiance? But tonight we're going to focus on the hard goodbyes. And let me tell you right off the bat, goodbyes are not easy. Lisa, specifically in this study, talks about human relationships. But I just want to put before you, there are many things that we say goodbye to. How many of us have either been fired from a job, we've left a job, right? We've had to say goodbye to something that we might have loved or to something that was toxic. Maybe if you're, you know, we've all been students and we said goodbye to our college life and our high school life. We've said goodbye to different ministries that we might have been a part of. I remember as a young mom, I felt some type of way when I had to say goodbye to breastfeeding. I was that mama. What if you've had to say goodbye to a dream? Or what if your dream got absorbed into someone else's dream? What if it was the dream of having children or there came a season in your life where you had to say goodbye to your uterus, your ovaries, because you've had a hysterectomy? I remember the one thing, I, I've, I've told this story about my twin sister and her ovarian cancer, and one thing she laments over more than anything, she was like, I wish I just had my old body back. And so maybe there's been something that's been a health challenge, and you just wish that you could have your old body back. You've had to say goodbye to that person that was a little bit healthier. Maybe it's been cancer. And you've had to say goodbye to your breast. Or are you in this room and you've had to say goodbye to a beloved pet? It all matters. And the way that we show up in those goodbyes will impact our future goodbyes. So sometimes when we're trying to say goodbye, all these emotions can get triggered because of what we've had to say goodbye to in our past. So as we look at the human relationship tonight, and we're going to focus on that, I just want you to know there are many other things in our life we say goodbye to. We've, at many times, have said goodbye to things that we need to say goodbye to. Maybe there's been a certain mindset that the, that the Lord has just delivered us from. Maybe it was people pleasing and accepting, and you're just a little bit older, and you like, it don't really matter what you think. Or maybe there's been debt that has just been like a bondage in your life and you've said goodbye. Listen, goodbyes can evoke grief, 
as you think about saying goodbye to a loved one, a relationship, but there's also some good goodbyes. I love that in the first day of this study, she talks about how we make peace with our memories. And she talks about being in the grocery store and just being overwhelmed. Did y'all read that? Yeah. Yeah. It just come out of nowhere, like a wave. But as we talk about relational goodbyes, that's what we're going to focus on this evening. It's what you're going to focus on in your table discussions. She gives these three different scenarios of when we say goodbye. And she uses examples in the Bible of these different scenarios. So the first one is sometimes people are sent away. And we're going to look at the story of Abraham and Lot. And then there are times when people will walk away. And we're going to talk about the rich young ruler. And then there are these times when there is just a parting of ways. It's a, it's a mutual decision. We're going to look at Paul and Barnabas. But these are just kind of the average of scenarios when we are saying goodbye in a human relationship aspect. So the first one is people are sent away, and we're going to look at Abraham and Lot, and they are family. And let me tell you, some of the hardest, most complex goodbyes are if they are, one, the person that you've birthed, or two, the person who has birthed you. It's the family that gets complicated. And so here you have these two men, Abraham and Lot. Lot is Abraham's nephew, and they're very wealthy. They have, Abraham has gold and silver and plenty of livestock. Well, if you have a lot of livestock, it requires a lot of land. And then you have Lot, who also owns a lot of flocks and herds and tents and people that are with him and family members. And so here they are living in the land of Canaan, which represents the land of promise, the land of plenty, the land of abundance. But there comes a point where they need to separate. There's a dispute that starts to happen. On the top of page 127, or if you want to follow in your Bible, Genesis 13, we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. And it says, But the land could not support them, them being Abraham and Lot, while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abraham's herders and Lot's. So it's a normal occurrence. Let me normalize this for you, that when you are with other humans, there can be disagreements, there can be tension, especially in families. I know we see these pictures on social media with these families that look so perfect, but let me tell you behind closed doors, some of y'all fought before you got here. There's quarreling, there's strife, there's tension, there's, there's anger. It all shows up. It's the reason you need to come to the EXO conference. Abraham proactively understands, he discerns that dysfunction is around the corner. He's able to discern it. And you might think to himself, oh my goodness, how did he know that? Well, verse four tells you, it says, there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And this is from the NIV. Abraham built an altar and worshiped the Lord in the land where he settled. There was a posture that Abraham had that he was able to discern what the spirit of the Lord was telling him to do. And so the question is, what is your posture? Are you so busy going that you don't have time to sit before the Lord to know with clarity what it is that you need to do? Many of us, as soon as we get in the car, we pick up the phone. Oh, so-and-so, they know I call every morning at 7 a.m., right? 
What if for a few mornings you decide, that's, I'm just going to use that time to just sit in silence and hear what the Lord is saying? Look at verses 8 and 9 of Genesis chapter 13. It says in verse 8, finally, Abraham said to Lot, let me stop right there. Finally, if you want to underline that in your Bible, if you got that Bible that you can write in. Finally, Abraham said to Lot, many times we're thinking that we need a boundary. And most of the times we just need to have a hard conversation. You tell everyone else how you feel, but you've not addressed the person that you need to address. And so you make the assumption that they know how, well, they should know how I, well, maybe they don't. Abraham said to Lot, for those of us in here that raised our hand that says we have adult children, listen, I know you call that person your, your, your child, your adult child, your pumpkin your baby boy, but you need to have a woman to man, a woman to woman conversation. For you to be parenting an adult child, you need to let them know and be vulnerable with them. Woman to woman, woman to man. Abraham said to Lot, Let's not allow this conflict to come between us and our herdsmen. After all, we are close relatives. Verse 9, the whole countryside is open to you. I love that. Abraham saying that to Lot. The whole, it's all open to you. You can have it. He's given like level 10 access. Take your choice of any section of the land you want, and we will what? We're going to separate. If you want the land to the left, which represented the north, moving north, he says, I'll go to the right, which represented going south. If you want or if you prefer the land on the right, then I'll go to the left. Now, Abraham as the elder was the one in the cultural norm of this day that would have first choice of the land. But because he's discerned what's around the corner, this strife, he offers it to Lot. He admits that there's conflict coming and we're family. And so what I want you to understand is in life, remember when Jim Crest, I think this was the video that Sister Tara showed, I want to say about week two or three, where if you've been in a mall and you've been looking for where you need to go or you've been in an airport and you're trying to see where your terminal is, there's always a dot that says what? You, you are here. Sister, where are you? In life, this is what we do. Oh, Craig, look at Oh, he's way over here. And Judy, huh, she just a hot mess. She went, right? And then there's Tim, he over here. And then mom, oh, she just so negative. And so we map out where everyone else is. We can tell where everyone else is in the family, at work. But where are you? Abraham had a realistic view of reality. We need to separate. And so the challenge for you this evening is that you have got to accept your reality. I knew a mom that she turned a blind eye to her daughter's alcoholism. It was a teenage daughter, and she found all these bottles under the bed, and she just, in her not wanting to deal with it, didn't accept you are here. It could be that you're saying, I have an alcoholic child. Listen, don't judge it. Don't explain it away. But understand where you are. 
be willing to search the room, the cell phone, the backpack, and anything else, because children at a certain age, it's you that's responsible for what they do. We've got to be alert. At the top of page 145, and I know I'm quoting a lot of Jim Crest because I feel like we all need a Jim Crest in our life. It says, my counselor Jim Crest, this is what Lisa speaking, has said to me time and again, mental health is a commitment to reality at all cost. It's at all cost. That I have to really understand this is where I am. Abraham discerned it, and he knew that they needed to separate. Abraham didn't hold a grudge. Remember how I said you could go north or south? That's what Abraham told him. You know what? Lot went east. He didn't follow the rules. Abraham didn't go after him. But he kept his heart tender because Lot moving east was representative of him moving away from the protection of God. He was moving towards sin and wickedness. And some of us, we've seen our family, we've seen those that we love move and make tragic mistakes. But even in that, Abraham kept his heart soft for Lot. There came a time in Genesis chapter 14, you can read it in your own time, that Lot was captured by enemy forces. And Abraham had to fight to get him back. We talked about how there is knowledge and there's discernment and there is consideration. You got to start thinking about how your decisions are impacting others around you. And then there's the application. That was on page 45. So here you find Lot, who's moved away from the land of plenty into a land of captivity. Oh, but he was rescued by Abraham. Isn't that such a beautiful picture of grace? And so, sister, who is the Lot in your life? And what is it that God is telling you to do? If he's telling you to move and go after that person, then move. Is that what the Lord said? I don't know if I heard. Let me ask my friend. No. If you have clarity that that's what God has told you to do, then you move. But if God has told you to stay, you stay. You stay firmly planted where you are. Because the encounter that person needs to have is not with you, but with Christ. These goodbyes are hard, ladies, but we must crave the wisdom of God. We must create a posture to hear what God is saying. All right, take your little breath as we move to the next part. People are going to walk away. They're going to abandon you. They're going to reject you. Not everybody, but there are those out there who will walk away. And some of us, we started our life in a deficit with parents who said, I don't want you. As we navigate these relationships and we're trying to not lose the best of who we are in these relationships, let's remember that here is the beauty is that we have a savior that understands. Remember, there was Peter that denied him and there was Judas who had walked with him and betrayed him. But tonight we're going to look at Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22, the rich young ruler who was a religious leader. Verse 17 says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Verse 19, well, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. You see how verse 19 is boundaries. 
Do you see how Jesus is giving boundaries? And all six of those commandments deal with relationships. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I've never drawn my eyes to that word, but it says he loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. Some translations will say he was disheartened and he went away. Where did he go? Away. The one that Jesus loved, where did he go? Away because he had great wealth. People will walk away. And let me tell you, sister, you will walk away. When you love someone, many times they're going to make decisions that benefit them, not you. And that's the reality, right? That's where we are. And so we probably all heard this saying, when someone shows you who they are, believe it the first time. You got to know, this is where I am. It's painful. Man, it's hard. But it's our reality. And, And when we allow ourselves to just know where we are, it allows healing to begin versus a mirage that is like everything's okay. In verse 21, when Jesus says to him, give to the poor, Jesus breaks right through to pride. It has nothing really to do with him being rich. Listen, you can have your money, but it's the love of that money. It's the love of your self-effort. It's the, I'm secure because I have this amount of possessions and wealth and all these things. As he cut right through that pride, it unveiled his security in his possessions. But did Jesus run after him? Like Abraham did not run after Lot. Jesus did not run after the rich young ruler. In fact, he turns to his disciples to further explain what had just happened. Jesus was without sin, but in his humanity here on earth, He was sinned against. He understands what what we're going to talk about, what you've been dealing with as you've been doing your study this week. He's been touched with that. He knows the sting of someone walking away. So in the video, which I would say if there's If you've not been able to watch a video, you've not watched a video, there's a bonus video. Let me tell you, sis, look at all of it because it is so rich. It is so good. This intersection of therapy and theology and just helping you to process what it is that you're feeling. But the therapist talks about these times when we should consider a goodbye. Like this is not a black or white. This is not your roadmap. It's just places where we should consider a goodbye. And the first thing he says is, if a person is unfaithful, and I know our mind goes to spouse, partners, all of that, but even in your friendships, you can have someone that is unfaithful to you. Maybe it's financially, maybe it's emotionally. But he said, look at where there's this repetitive cycle of lying, omitting, the truth, or gaslighting. He actually used the acronym LOG, lying, omitting the truth, or gaslighting. Gaslighting being, I say, oh, the sky is blue. The person says, no, the sky is red, even though they know it's blue. But the person doesn't want to accept your accurate truth because they want to throw you off. It's often used in abusive relationships. This is why it is one of the tactics that the enemy uses. It's the highest form of, one of the highest forms of abuse that you can have is that mind manipulation. 
So they constantly, deliberately feed you this false information. And then you're thinking, well, what did I see? Or what did I hear? You're just so thrown off. Or maybe it's the person that has just apologized but not repented. Repented meaning that they've changed course. They've changed the behavior. Because, you know, you can have someone say, you know, like, I'm sorry, um, can we move on now? Can we be intimate right now? Right? Because they said, I'm sorry. No, what was the impact of what they did to you? Or maybe there's been time where they're blaming you for their egregious behavior. Like if someone is in a, a relationship and some, uh, one of the partners is having an affair and you confront that person and they're like, well, you know, you weren't here. You were always so busy. And so they start listing all these things, blaming you for their indiscretion. It might be time to consider a goodbye. Maybe it's a person who's had a pattern of being rude and abusive, whether it's physically, verbally, emotionally, being disrespectful. They've ignored all your boundaries. Or maybe it's been like, man, it's been spiritual abuse. You've been walking in some ministries or there is no pain like church pain. I am here to tell you there's no pain like that. And so sometimes there's these weaponizing of scriptures. And, you know, so I, I, I just have to say this. Sometimes we can be so in awe when someone quotes scripture. Listen, everybody quoting scripture don't know Christ. James 2.19 talks about even the demons quote scripture. And I remember when I was dating many moons ago, it was like, oh, he tall because, you know, I'm tall. So he had to be tall. Check. Oh, he said a scripture. Oh, check. Oh, gosh. Yeah, we're in a relationship now. Ladies, people will throw you off throwing scripture at you because they know that's your little area. You got to know the word for yourself. It's the tactic that Jesus, that the enemy used with Jesus in the wilderness. Remember when he just kept throwing scripture? Remember Eve and she's sitting there like it just disorients you and it's like, well, did God say? Hmm. Or we'll say to someone where we try and guilt them into um, something I was having a cup of coffee before I came, and I was telling the person on the other phone, I was like, oh, I'm having a cup of coffee just to kind of pep myself up. It's two times. It's no joke. And the person was like, well, Jesus ought to pep you up. Listen, I want my cup of coffee, and I don't need you talking about Jesus ought to pep me up. I mean... Can we just not weaponize scripture in in a way that just doesn't make sense? She, the, the therapist talks about those that are in addiction. That's hard. Fentanyl is rampant in our it's rampant in our world. It's impacting our children. And so he talks about what happens when you are in relationship with someone who is in an active addiction. And he even gives a little script of what you say. I'm telling you, do not miss the videos. You can't, you can't boundary someone. We've talked about this into changing their behaviors. You know, like you can't drug anymore. You can't drink anymore. You can't vape anymore. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And so how do you handle that? Ladies, you're in here. You know what I'm talking about. You might not have shared it at your table, but all of us in our families have most likely dealt with someone in an active addiction. Yeah, these goodbyes. But here's the thing. As we say goodbye, 
they talk about this this week, God be with ye. Think about it that it's the highest form of surrender and trust in the sovereignty of God that when we're saying goodbye to someone, something, some moment, that it is God be with ye. That we're turning them over into the hands of Christ. And that the justice that we want, because we're angry, we're hurt, they're off living this grand life, and we're struggling to keep the kids together, to keep the family together. That justice that we seek will come at the hand of God, because you might think they're living their best life, but there is consequences for every sin, including our own. But we thank God for his grace. Listen, if you are being pricked in your heart and you know maybe it's a hard conversation, maybe it's a boundary, maybe it's a goodbye, the first place you start is you pray, you posture yourself to hear the Lord. And then you might need someone to walk alongside you, whether it's a therapist, whether it's an accountability partner, a mentor, a pastoral counsel, someone. Think about, am I honoring God in this relationship? Because this study is not about us leaving people. It is about us loving them in the way that Christ loves them, but without us losing ourselves. We're victorious, ladies. Whatever it is that you're walking through, whatever the goodbye, whatever the pain, the emotion, you got to know you are victorious. That there, our God stands with you through all these moments. Toxic realities and relationships will not tame themselves. We can't ignore them into good health. And I know as women, we just, I just want to avoid. Gosh, I just, I don't want to deal with that. And so I get myself busy. Well, I got to go. I got to go to church. And it's like, but we, you know, we need to have a conversation. No, but I got to go. I got to go. I got to go to work. Listen, where are you? All right, we'll, we'll move to the third one. You can take a breath, breath. Or maybe it's just me that need to take a breath. But <laughs> As we finish this evening, I want us to think about there are times when there is a parting of ways and it's a mutual decision. Paul and Barnabas is the example that she used. And I love this because it's two men of God and they have this heated discussion. I know many of you think church people do not fight or argue or disagree. But in this story, we see it because it happens in the reality of where we are. Paul has this heart to go back and check on the churches that he started in his first missionary journey. And he is traveling with Barnabas. And Barnabas has a cousin. And you know, for the second missionary journey, you know, you've kind of been there one time. And so you want to bring somebody with you. And so he wants to bring John Mark, his cousin, Barnabas. And Paul is like, no, I have a boundary. (laughs) He obviously doesn't say that, but there's a boundary that he sets to say, I know you want to bring John Mark, but no, he left us in the first go round. He can't come back. And so it picks up in Acts chapter 15, verses 39 through 40, or on page 128, or on the screen, it says, Paul and Barnabas had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of of the Lord. Don't you know that when someone walks out, God has somebody else for you? Your best days are not behind you. I believe the best days are in front of you. Paul was a fierce defender of spreading the gospel, and he was focused on his mission. And he had this boundary that John Mark was not going to travel with them on their second missionary journey. And so the two men disagreed. It says sharp disagreement. It means emotionally charged. 
You know, sometimes we're in situations and, you know, it, it starts getting rising tones, passionate discussions, and we might get a little nervous about that, especially sometimes when it happens in a church and we think, oh my goodness, this isn't supposed to happen in a church. Let me tell you something. You stand right there in the confidence of Christ and what he's telling you to do. Paul was a defender of the gospel, and he says he's not going. That was the boundary he had. And so here you have Barnabas who's saying, but I have this personal conviction. Now, what are they going to do? I can tell you right now, our ego always wants to be right and win every single argument. I just was in a little confrontation with someone, you know, not a physical confrontation, but... <laughs> Words were exchanged. I wasn't moving. I wasn't budging. But guess who was wrong? It happens. Our egos want to be right. We want to have our personal conviction on someone else. Let me tell you something, sister. You reduce that mental load and let them be. Because in this case, there, there came this parting of ways. They both had reasons for saying goodbye. There was no right or no wrong. Sometimes it's just like we got to disagree, agree to disagree. And I want to say this, everyone cannot go where you're going. And so you will see that there will be this organic plucking of people out of your life because everyone cannot go where you are going. For those of us who are married and you look back at your wedding pictures, am I even friends with half the people that was in my wedding party in the 90s? I, you know. Everybody can't go where you're going. And so where there's this mutual parting of ways, it's okay. But again, Paul keeps his heart soft towards John Mark because in 2 Timothy 4.11, it says, as he's writing to Timothy, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in ministry. Some translations will say he is useful to me in ministry. So there are some times when there's reconciliation. I just had a sister tell me that. It's not for everybody. Everyone's not going to have a reconciliation or a restoration of a relationship, but they did. And the good news is the gospel spread because of the goodbye. And so it's important for us to understand, give people space to leave. If you're taking notes, if you have your phone and you have a note section, can you just write that? Give people space to leave. Don't talk bad about them. Don't discredit their past contributions. Give them space to leave. Paul gave Barnabas space to leave. Because sometimes in that leaving, it keeps a relationship from destruction. I remember when I managed large teams and, it, you know, you, I might open my laptop and there was somebody's resignation letter and people would be all, you know, had to tell HR, blah, 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 all the things. And I remember saying, listen, I'm not going to cry over who's not here. I'm going to focus on who's still here because we got a whole team. We can't be crying spoiled milk over he was not here. God will bring restoration in a way that you're not even looking for. And so as we... Talk about relationships. I, I just want us to know there's many things we should say goodbye to. And one of them is, as I'm about to pray, what is your mindset? Maybe as I was talking about manipulation and how we're trying to manipulate and guilt people into changing their behaviors, maybe that's you. Or maybe there's a, there's a level of control that you just got to control everything. And the weight of that is, is exhausting mentally. You're just popping in every conversation 
within the family, within the circle of friends, and it's weighing heavy on you. Maybe there's low confidence in what you should be saying or how you should say it, or maybe there's feelings of unworthiness because someone did abandon you. Or maybe you're just feeling like, I, am I enough? I heard a woman say that today, and I thought, man, she's willing to admit I'm here. I don't feel like I'm enough. She doesn't need to judge it. She doesn't need to explain it away. But she does need to have an acknowledgement of this is where I am. I'm not going to move from here, ladies. We have to understand where we are. Stop mapping everybody else's journey and start understanding our own. Where do we need to say goodbye to negative mind chatter? The enemy in this highest form of abuse is whispering. As we heard our sister say last week, I'm a procrastinator. It was the badge in which she moved about the world. Even in a backyard patio. Maybe you've said, man, so many people have told me I'm a train wreck. Maybe that's just what I'm just destined to be or that you're so extra, or you can't save money, or you're living paycheck to paycheck, or this is just how I am. I want to pray that as we go into these table discussions, that we're willing to admit, one, where we are, and two, that we expire some of this negative mind chatter. There is so much work we need to do. And we're sitting here in awe of what the enemy is doing and shock. Listen, he clear on his mission. Are you clear on yours? We don't have to be in shock and awe over the darkness that we see in the world. He's clear on his mission. He will continue to do what he does. It's what, where are we? What's our mission? What's our assignment? Lord, I know you sit down, Rosalind. God, I thank you that in the midst of what you're teaching us, I pray that it doesn't fall on deaf ears, God. May we move where you say move. May we stay where you're saying stay. God, we seek your will in relationships. This is a heavy message because relationships can be complex. But may we posture ourselves to understand where we are. And may we hear your voice. I know that my sister's heart is pricked tonight. I know that there's something that has bubbled up inside of her. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that she does not run from your voice. That she does not ignore what you say to her. This world is engineered to distract her, me, but may she commit this evening to surrender in a way like she never has before. God, may you show her just the right next step to take. Lord, sometimes we can get so far in the future. It's what is people going to think? What is this going to look like a year from now? May you just give us the right next step. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's a hard conversation. Maybe it's a boundary. But Father, may there be overflow as we move in obedience to what you would have us to do. Give us your manna, Lord, like only you can. May the conversations tonight be rich and honoring to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. amen.